Mark, the microphone's yours. Well, I feel like I'm among giants today with uh, Peg here, who's a scientist who I've revered for a decade, and Dr. Joe Heckman in the back wearing his Rutgers hat. Um, uh, he's, he's been working on this project forever and ever, and it's, it's near and dear to his heart. And he works with dirt in the soil, but yet he knows the connection between the soil and the gut. It's very powerful in terms of that holistic approach to, to food and medicine and all that stuff. So he's a great partner in this. And, you know, I, I, wherever I go, it's sometimes Joe shows up. So today he showed up. I'm very proud to have you here. Thank you, Joe. Abby, thank you for the invitation. It's been a long journey, a beautiful journey. And what a fantastic venue. Um, when Abby and I first met back in, gosh, I don't know, 2004 or something like that, I can't remember, it's a long time, and we've seen each other a couple times since, she said, someday I'm going to have a raw milk dairy on the Hudson. And you know what? That happened. And here she has cows being milked and people coming in and customers picking up their milk and taking it home and telling stories and completing the loop. And she has an organic farm here with organic soil. She's got biodynamics going on, to cherry on top of that, wonderful cows. Fantastic team, Cam. You've done a great job with Matt and Zach and the rest of your team. And you know what? This is a great place to speak about what we're going to talk about today. Um, you know, when people hear raw milk, what are you talking about? Didn't that go away 100 years ago? Um, it's coming back. And today, as the chairman of the Raw Milk Institute, I work with dairies around the world with a, a distinguished board of directors that are PhDs that know far more than I do. But I try to bring together a team of people to, t to talk to others internationally about this because it's emerging. I don't know if you know this, but in, in Great Britain, 0.7% of all milk sold is raw. Mm. That's a lot. It's huge when you consider the fact you can only sell it on the farm. <laughs> Pretty amazing. So today, um, raw milk like no other food on earth, we're going to touch on this. And instead of having a four-day dissertation on this entire subject, I'm going to hit the high points and kind of get through it because we don't want to take that much time. It's being recorded, so thank you so much for recording this so we can share it with others. But it is like no other food on earth, and uh, it's a powerful food. It's the first food of life. Think about it. First food of life. Baby's born, what's it do? Suckles a mom, that's raw milk. Powerful thing. And when scientists study milk, they go to breast milk as their reference, their gold standard, because it is the incredible evolutionary uh, result of 100,000 years, or you can add a million years to that if you'd like, um, of nature working to perfect a food for babies. And so it has no alternative. It is the real thing. So today we're going to try to talk about that and give it some perspective. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Abby, on uh, making it beautiful for your cows. You know, there's a beauty in nature. You go out into nature and you see a forest. There's complete chaos, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a beauty in the chaos. It's the diversity of change and differences of the way things evolve and break down and die and live and born and all those kinds of things. That's a nature that we're kind of missing in the first world nations and being destroyed. And, and Abby's dedication to making a beauty in the chaos of nature is so wonderful and so profound in terms of where we're going, in terms of the earth and the gut and our reality around us. So congratulations on your beautiful, uh, not only your, your work here in this incredible uh, uh, shrine, bovine shrine, I guess. Um, the cows actually spend their winter times in here in a nice cozy uh, environment. And uh, in the summer times, we get to speak in here and gather as people. So pretty cool stuff. The cows are out in pasture today. But uh, what a wonderful shrine to have people get together and be educated. Education is perhaps one of the greatest things we're missing right now in the nutritional environment. We have a saying at Organic Pastures in the Raw Milk Institute, you don't sell raw milk, you teach raw milk. Because why would anybody want to buy raw milk? Well, if you understand why, give me that raw milk, I need it today. Uh, so you really have to understand the why before you'd ever want to have a demand for it, ever. So it's a teaching challenge more than anything else. Um, it's a dream come true, and it's a dream come true to me to see people here. Uh, connecting the, the customers to the farm and connecting that loop back together. And then you are pollinating back to where you came from the stories we're sharing today and hopefully perpetuating this educational challenge we have today. But congratulations to your dream come true. Um, cleaning green from uh, grass to glass. As the chairman of the Raw Milk Institute, I sit with other directors who actually work with dairymen around the world to um, 
help them appreciate what they do to make raw milk safe. Now, safety is a relative term. The Volvo car is a very safe car, but people get killed in them all the time. And aviation is a very safe way to travel, but planes crash once in a while. So you have to take a risk balance in your life in terms of what's going on. It's very interesting to note that very seldom is there a risk-benefit balance made. And that's one of the things that, that Peg works on, is the fact that when you take this risk, what other benefit do you get in the balance? And one of the things we're doing to ourselves in America is sterilizing our foods, taking antibiotics, creating superbugs by antibiotic abuse, and creating something that's really a risk to our immune system because you have superbugs, right? At the same time, we're weakening our immune systems. So you're making this tremendous imbalance, you know, where you have an opportunistic uh, host, our bodies, which are very weakened by the immune system depression. At the same time, we have a very tenacious, uh, virulent pathogen. And our goal here is to bring that back into balance where you have a strong immune system and fewer, if any, virulent pathogens. So you can thrive and survive and not be subject to getting sick. Uh, there's not a lot of that thought going on right now in medicine. That's a new thought. That's a pioneering concept that when you would go to the doctor, you say, what are we gonna do to build your immune system today? Have you ever heard that? I don't think so. You hear that more at a farmer's market than you do at a, at a, at a, at a place at a doctor. Well, we hope that medical schools will start to adopt some of these concepts and start to say, what do we do to prevent you becoming ill? Because we can't afford you getting sick. In 1961, we spent 6% of our gross national product in America for medical care. Anybody have an idea what it is today? It's an excess of 22%. We're going the wrong way really quickly. That's why we mentioned Farmers Over Pharmacies a little earlier, because it truly really is in chronic disease, not acute, you got shot, you had an accident. Modern medicine is fantastic for trauma. Fantastic, wonderful. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to chronic disease process, it is not the absence of drugs that will make you better. It's the absence of nutrition that will make you better. So we're actually bringing nutrition to your world that will make you better. So it really is the future of sustainable medicine and chronic disease to engage whole foods. And whole foods come from farmers markets in the soil, not from some shelf life preserving process that's highly processed that your body has no idea what to do with it. So we actually did an audit here at uh, Churchtown, and Abby asked me to uh, bring Churchtown into the, the community of the Raw Milk Institute listed farmers. And so I'm very proud to um, have today uh, the honor of introducing um, Abby's Churchtown Dairy and Cam and everyone to be number 17 dairy in the United States of America oh. and internationally as being listed by the Raw Milk Institute. So come on up. There you are. Well earned. Matt, Zach, are you in here at all? Of course, Matt. There you go. Matt, take a stand, buddy. You actually milk the cows. So, congratulations to you. Uh, this process took a little while. It didn't happen overnight, but they filled out a 180 question survey. They had me go through and work with their team. By the way, their team was really easy to work with. You guys had already had your act together pretty darn good. Uh, when comparing other dairies, you guys took the shortcut because you already had a lot done already. But I, I've worked much harder and much longer with other dairies to get them done than you have. You really had your act together. But nonetheless, congratulations on being number 17. From that, you will have a website access portal where people pull up front here and see pretty roses and nice picket fences and stuff. You have no idea what's going on inside of the milk lines or inside of the buckets behind the scenes. And what this does is it allows the consumers to see what's going on with your bacteria counts and your food safety plan and the work that Matt does every day and every night when you're sleeping uh, or when you're getting up early and he's working hard to understand what's in your bottle. Not on the label, but what's inside the bottle and have a very high level of confidence that it's not only safe, but fantastically nutritious. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> congratulations. Behind the scenes, we found good management, uh, good conditions, very clean conditions, and conscientious management, people that cared. Um, and here's some pictures here showing that every cow has a milk weight. Pretty, un pretty unbelievable. Oh, am I? I need to use the Every cow has a, let's go, whoa. That was quick, let's go back here a little bit. There we go. Every cow has a milk weight. 
they uh, take great diligence to make sure that their milk is very high quality and they keep green, green, clean, clean, hot, hot, and cold, cold. It's kind of a mantra we have. Because if you're inconsistent in any of those things, things start to fall apart. So they've done a very good job of documenting what they do, how they do it, and how they train the next person that may relieve them to do it so it's consistent. Because you'll have your failure on uh, New Year's Eve or Christmas Day or Saturday night. Somebody's not watching. You've got to have your game on all the time if you want to have a consistent outcome with your products. And what we've shown is by testing their food safety plan, which is a ramp plan, a risk analysis management plan from grass to glass, the entire food chain from the origin of the milk and the cows all the way to the customer, that in fact the test revealed a very low coliform count and no pathogens. So they not only written their own food safety plan and had us work with them to develop that program, but also then validated it that in fact it works. We found out very early on at the Raw Milk Institute that you don't go out and act as the Raw Milk Police. What you need to do is go out and have that farmer do his best job of, of using the conditions he is in. Because you may have snow here and rain, or in California it's desert, sunshine. And your plan here will be different than somebody else's plan. So one shoe doesn't fit all feet. So you have to go out and listen to the farmer, and we want to become the farmer's good tool to show all the hard work they've done to their customers that come to them and be able to trust and rely. Years ago, we recognized that we were being blamed for all kinds of things that wasn't fair. In the United States of America today, the FDA considers one kind of raw milk, and that milk gets to be pasteurized. They fail to understand that there's another kind of raw milk, raw milk for people. And that raw milk is very clean, done by conscientious farmers that are concerned about that raw milk going directly to people without being pasteurized. And that's an entirely different product. Entirely different product. The standards are different, the way it's done, the conditions, you just name it, it's different. And so that's the, the importance of the Raw Milk Institute is to be able to show the difference between raw milk for the pasteurizer versus raw milk for the people. And over the last eight years, uh, we've been able to collect about 15,000 data points, which is a huge amount of data for people like Peg Coleman and Dr. Katrina Berg and Dr. Tom Bars to study and actually peer review to put out into the literature to say, hey, wait a minute, there is a form of raw milk which is very, very low risk, in fact, extremely low risk, and in fact, it's very, very beneficial. And there's a little bit more of a story to tell, but this is the, the power of the numbers of the facts to actually show the distinguished difference between those two kinds of raw milk. And that's one of the goals we had 10 years ago when we started the Raw Milk Institute was to, to show that distinction. And you can see um, how clean the, the cheese plant is there, how wonderful the documentation is. Um, they do a great job of cleaning their udders. They go beyond that to check to make sure that what's coming out of the udders is a healthy, clean cow inside. Not just the outside, but inside the udder, and there's ways you can do that. It takes a professional farmer like Matt and his friends to figure that one out. Uh, the conditions are nice and dry and clean uh, all the days of the year, not just on a day like today. So powerful uh, that they've taken care of all this stuff for you. Um, they do a nice job of cleaning and controlling their milk management area, where the milk gets chilled rapidly, and it's uh, chilled down to just below, above freezing within just a few minutes of milking, which keeps a nice long shelf life, because remember, milk's a living food. The bacteria found in milk at body temperature want to double every 20 minutes. It wants to become yogurt badly. <laughs> so if you want to drink fluid milk that tastes good, you need to keep it really cold. And then if you want to let it go to yogurt, fine, you can do that. Let it get warm. It'll become yogurt, especially add a little yogurt culture into it. But it's a living food with an incredible amount of things in it that we don't even understand completely yet. So nice job of managing their milk as well. Uh, again, keep clean, clean, green, green, cold, cold, hot, hot, be consistent, and test to make sure that your plan works. Those are the things we do at the Raw Milk Institute that they do here, and they do at 16 other dairies in North America, and soon in the Europe, European Union, to actually begin to validate, that in fact, there's two different kinds of raw milk in America, in America and in the world. So congratulations again on being number 17. Uh, I don't know if that's a magic number or not, but it's the number you got. It's the next one in line. Um, we added this logo to our, our, uh, our, our brand just a, a couple months ago because we are now international, which is really kind of exciting with Canada and the European Union. So these are chart recorders here which show a cycle of, of milk as it goes through the systems. Uh, the temperature at which you do the cleaning, the hot water, and the temperature at which you do the chilling on the milk. And the good records are very important in terms of keeping track of what happened to your milk from grass to glass. 
Um, there is a rising international demand for raw milk. Why is that? Well, pasteurization, developed in the late 1800s, kind of served an interesting, weird purpose. It took care of mankind's failings in terms of being filthy. When people moved to the city from the countryside in the 1800s, they took their cow with them because it was critical. They needed their cow because you didn't have to hunt fish. And you had food wherever the cow had grass and sunshine and a little rain once in a while. You had food today and your children didn't starve. People were starving literally 200 years ago. They spent a great deal of time every year just wondering how they were going to eat. And if you had a goat, a cow, a sheep, a camel, a horse, you could have milk today. And by the way, yogurt and kefir tomorrow. And you can have cheese next winter, all from that cow. So it was a very, very, very important uh, form of sustenance. In fact, in the 1630s, it was uh, part of Gamestown. It was required you had a musket and a cow. Because if you didn't, you were going to die. And so we, we forget about that in, in, the, in the 2000s. So um, it is an emerging market. And the safety of raw milk is not well understood. And that's why Raw Milk Institute stepped out to try to do that pioneering work to define it, legitimize it, and represent it with good science that the politicians couldn't argue with and to make it really legitimate. And that's what we're working really hard on. The politics of processors and market control. One of the reasons why when you go to change the law to get raw milk legalized in your state, because it's not legal in every state, you'll find that the processors show up. Well, why do they show up? Because they don't get to touch raw milk. It goes around them. It goes from the farmer to the customer. It does not go through the processing plant. So it's, it's li literally considered kind of a rogue milk because they can't control it. And there's, a, there's an old mantra within the processing industry is if you don't control the milk, you don't control the market. So it's out of control milk that goes around the, the processors. And if anybody knows about the dairy industry right now, it's in full-blown collapse. 47 dairies were lost in Wisconsin last month alone. 500 dairies last year. Half the dairies in the last 15 years have been lost. That's because the value of pasteurized milk is so low to the dairymen, there's no value added in just dumping milk quickly because you can have as big a dairy as you want, 10,000, 15,000 cows, and just do it as fast as you want because anything goes to the milk tank. And that dairyman doesn't get very much money for the milk. So when you're producing milk and you're getting, let's say, 13 to $15 per hundred weight, which is about 30, 40 a gallon, but you need 18 or 20 to break even, after a while your visa card gets maxed and you go negative, right? You can't do it. In fact, kind of uh, Jim Costa, our congressman in California, says, uh, what's a successful dairyman look like? An almond grower? <laughs> because they have to bring in money to support what they're doing because they're not making money on the dairy. And that's really tragic for the smaller operations. They don't have that extra money from the side because they simply have to give up. And we're seeing that tragically go on. So we are seeing an emerging market based on the lack of value added in pasteurized fluid milk. There's innate value added in raw milk because you can't fake it. The work that does and the value of that bacteria count takes legitimate hard work. And that value is obviously brought in all kinds of benefits to the consumer and their gut biome, which we're going to get into a little bit more. So very interesting to see that. Um, and there's a lot of regulatory pressure, obviously, against uh, raw milk. And we want to push back against that regulatory pressure with true science. You got a question then? I don't want to distract you. Sure. Oversupply. Oversupply. When you have 10 and 15 and 20,000 cow dairies in Texas, and you've got very efficient trucking systems that can move milk all over the United States, you see consolidation. You see the dairies moving out of areas that are more difficult to dairy in, and where the feeds are cheaper, and you move the milk at great cost, three or 4,000 miles sometimes, 2,000 miles, it's not unusual. They're selling uh, organic milk from California into Indiana in big trucks at costing five to six dollars per hundred weight, which is a tremendous subsidy to the farmer if the farmer got that instead of the trucking company. So there's all kinds of problems going on that, um, believe it or not, the Canadians have not had for 50 years. In fact, I'm spending some time next week in, in, uh, at a fly-in with the National Farmers Union to talk about this because with the loss of dairies across the United States, including organic dairies, not raw milk dairies, but organic dairies, the ones that pasteurize their milk, um, there's a lot of work to be done to, to correct our problems right now. Corruption and some other issues. So. That's another discussion I want to get into. Um, okay. 
So what's it all about with Rabba? What's going on there? Let's talk about this much deeper and get into the, the nitty gritty of this uh, a little bit. It's, it's like no other food on the earth. You think about the evolutionary pressures of 100,000 years of generation by generation selection, the pressures of selection, that only the best survived, the others did not. So the better things were every generation, the more humans thrived and the better things were. If it wasn't that way, then you would have gone the other way and humans would have died off. So what you've got here, it's a really important part of this. Uh, I go to the International Milk Genomics Consortium conferences every year. My wife and I attend that. Uh, we've gone for the last seven years. We, we watch these PhDs suffer through their, their anxiety over the fact that they can't make a better a baby formula because the optimal baby formula is a living food and what they make in a lab is not. And so they're very frustrated by the fact that, that uh, these baby formulas are trying to derive from raw, uh, raw breast milk or, or cow's milk or um, literally can't be replicated because they're so intricate and so much that mankind's not been involved, it's been mother nature. So very powerful in terms of the evolution of, of the species in terms of optimal food. If you look here, you can see uh, the milk maiden effect here back in the 16, 17, 1800s. The immunity, the fact that we cohabitated so closely with animals that we actually started cross uh, communicating our immune systems. And so uh, you, you had smallpox, the immunity for smallpox, um, the cowpox was actually an immunity for that. And those that milked the cows didn't get smallpox. So very interesting things historically are very important to understand. The Maasai in Kenya um, drink a lot of raw milk. And uh, the Mongolians in Outer Mongolia and China drink a lot of raw milk. Um, thousands and thousands of years, that cow, or that horse, that sheep, that camel was the available food today. Didn't have to hunt, didn't have to fish, didn't have to grow something, didn't have to wait. Yet food today. In fact, the ancient Hindus said the cow was the mother of the universe because if the mother human died, the cow, the goat, the sheep would actually support the baby and that baby would thrive. So pretty powerful there. Um, it's food right now. It's not have to wait. Um, it's portable. You can take your cow with you. In fact, all the Conestoga wagons coming across the United States uh, in the 1800s had a couple cows behind. If you got really hungry, you'd kill the cow, right? Um, the bottom line was you had food today. And uh, it, was, uh, it had all kinds of, of value to it. It contained a biodiversity of bacteria. And it contained a, a huge amount of bacteria when fermented. Our most advanced scientists now know that you need to have a lot of bacteria and you need to have the biodiversity of that bacteria, different kinds of bacteria, and the food to feed that bacteria. Those three factors are critical. And pasteurization destroyed that. Yogurt brought it back a little bit, but you only get three or four different kinds of bacteria. Kefir has 120, 140 different kinds of bacteria, or maybe even more than that, depending on where you get it from. So we're losing our biodiversity in our gut which has a tremendous effect on stem cell differentiation and the function of our immune system. The more we have different selections of bacteria to kind of exercise against, the more we have resilience in our ecosystems. You know, you're kind of a, a little boy in a bubble in trouble. If you sterilize yourself and you protect yourself from the environment around you, those things in your environment will actually come get you because you don't have immunity to them. So the more and the earlier we can expose ourselves to biodiversity of bacteria, the stronger our immune systems become. And raw milk has played that surface for all time. First is breast milk, because breast milk has how many different kinds of bacteria? 700. And counting, probably. Uh, and it has pathogens in it. Wow. So kids can do their immune system push-ups and not get sick from them and then they come in later. Um, and all kinds of proteins, 2,500 proteins and counting. So, I mean, this stuff's complex stuff, right? And that's Mother Nature's gift to mom. And by the way, breastfeeding is not a one-way street. The baby shares its needs back to mom through the nipple and up in the breast and says, Mom, I need this antibody to fight this whole thing right now. Mm -hmm. And it goes back and forth, back and forth as this commensal joint uh, colony mom and baby together. So, powerful stuff. And, and that's where raw milk is it's actually been part of our lives for longer than we actually have appreciated. Um, and we don't appreciate that. We don't understand that. There was a dark time for raw milk in the USA and even in the other parts of the world. There was a dark time in, uh, in Russia and in, in the UK and England uh, in the 1800s. And uh, it was mostly the cow diets 
There are conditions, toilets, you know, flushing toilets, although no composting toilets. We won't talk about composting toilets. They're pretty cool. Anybody knows about Abby, she does, she's a rock star on composting toilets. But anyway, they did not have good sanitary conditions. Uh, there was no refrigeration, and there was tuberculosis, brucellosis, and typhoid, and everything else going on. And the water quality was horrible. They commingled the, the sewage and the waste with water, and it was just a mess. So we had this dark time where a lot of people died from raw milk coming from these distillery dairies. The cows were being malnourished and the cows were being brought from the countryside into a very concentrated uh, community of people that lived very densely. And it was no longer the cow out in the sunshine out here. It was the cow brought into the city that was the problem. They were being fed unusual weird things in unclean conditions. And 40 to 50% of the people that drank that milk died. It was horrendous. So we had a real dark age there. And that's where the beginning of pasteurization took hold. Because you didn't have to worry about cleanliness anymore. All you just cooked the heck out of it. But we lost so much we did not realize until literally the last couple of decades. And uh, an interesting point in history was uh, the AAMMC, Dr. Coit, uh, the American Association of Medical Milk Conditioning, was established in 1893. And actually flourished quite well until the 1940s and 50s. And that was where you had physicians supervised raw milk that was certified. In other words, bacterial counts uh, were tested. They looked at the quality of the water. They had a food safety plan, not unlike what the Raw Milk Institute does today. But the last uh, dairy to be certified for the AAMMC was Altadena Dairy in Los Angeles, and they went defunct in 1999. That was actually the beginning of what Organic Pastures Dairy picked up, because people started showing up at our dairy and saying, we want our milk raw, we want it from organic, and we were the closest dairy to LA. So it's kind of interesting uh, misnomer in history 20 years ago. But just to, to, to touch on this, there is a dark period. That dark period has been amplified and made into a political mantra against raw milk, when in fact it was never the raw milk's problem, it was mankind and what we did to the cows and the environment that was the problem. Now we understand biology, now we understand the conditions, now we understand testing, we have really, really advanced food safety testing technologies. We can bring raw milk forward very safely for our customers. So uh, just to, to point on that, which we don't deny this, it happened, we understand it, we learned a lot from it, but now we can go beyond that. Uh, Dr. Annette Jewett, um, wonderful gal. She's a PhD uh, researcher at UCLA, and she studies cancer. And she was one of the people that discovered this load of bacteria and diversity of bacteria being so critical uh, early on, she discovered this several years ago, to differentiation of stem cells, as well as decreasing inflammation in your body. So you get this load of bacteria from obviously having an environment where they want to grow, and you get the diversity of bacteria from what you're actually eating. And then you need to feed that bacteria. By the way, popping a couple of probiotic pills don't work very well. If you want to have alligators in the swamp, you've got to have a swamp first because alligators don't live in a desert. Okay? So the bottom line is, if you want to have good diversity and good uh, probiotic activity in your gut, you have to eat right. You have to eat the foods, the prebiotic foods, that actually will support the biology when they're introduced into the gut. Or else you have to starve them. Think about it. Your gut doesn't do really well with antibiotics. Does it do really well with sterilized foods or foods with preservatives in them or sugars that grow a lot of yeast? So those foods don't support a very good biome in your gut. You need farmer's market foods, unprocessed whole natural foods, and you need the inoculum, the good bacteria, the kefirs, the raw milk cheeses, the raw milk, to actually go in and bring the bacteria into that food area to actually grow the microbiome to actually function properly and therefore you'll have a functioning immune system. So this is work she's done. It's really, really important work. And she's actually shown recovery and, um, and prevention of cancers in some uh, cases. And this is very early stuff, a lot of work to be done. But she's found that stem cells really misbehave themselves and do stupid things like become cancer cells when they don't have the load in biodiversity oh. bacteria, which actually determines where they're going to go, what they're going to do. So this is deep microbiome stuff that really needs to be researched and worked on because, like I said, we're at 22% or more GMP right now for our, our medical situation in America. We can't afford that. And what we need to do is prevent it. That's why the future is farmers over pharmacies in terms of getting back to the soil and the dirt and the food to prevent all these diseases going for, forward. This is a really important video. If anybody gets, wants to watch this, uh, you can find it. Um, it's a TED Talk. Dr. Bonnie Basler, Princeton University. It's really worthwhile, about 12, 15 minutes of your time, and you go, whoa, this is powerful. Uh, a few years ago, um, Dr. Bonnie Basler was one of the researchers with the human biome, uh, human gut biome, 
And by the way, the, the biome of the body is determining what genetically drives us. Um, was not funded by the medical community. Anybody have an idea what it was funded by? Peg, you can't say anything. The Department of Energy, our military people who actually were concerned about the exposure of humans to, radio to radiation. What were those guys working on the submarines and on the nuclear aircraft carriers and, and nuclear plants? What was going to happen to them after 10 or 15 years of being exposed to radiation? And they wanted to know what made us genetically human. So about $4 billion was spent between the NIH and the Department of Energy, and they found out that, wow, they announced this, I think it was in 2002 or three. They announced that they found it, but uh, they didn't find it. <laughs> they found that, yeah, there's 23,000 uh, genes that make us human in terms of the framework, but that the deeper genetics was incredibly complex, and it was like 98% made up of the bacteria in our body that actually share genomic information, genes, with our human cells to complete our genome. That makes us bacterial sapiens. We're no longer sterile human beings with bacteria that invaded us. We are way populated with bacteria, and they are there for a reason, and they've always been there, and when they're not there, we get sick and die. If there's a take-home today, that's the take-home. So go in search of good bacteria and the food to feed them. Food to feed them first and then the bacteria will find a place that they're gonna be all happy and warm and develop their ecosystems and stay there for the long term. But it's food to feed the bacteria and then the bacteria that drive our ecosystems inside and our genome, and that's the basis of our human, human, uh, human function, how we, how we work. So Dr. Bonnie Basler here, she has these diagrams where she's showing this relationship between the cell count in our body for bacterial cells and human cells is 10 to one. You pick your number, one, one trillion cells human and 10 trillion bacterial cells. But the bigger take home is the relationship between the DNA contributed by that bacteria is 100 to 1. So we really, really have a big problem with, take it, what do you want to talk about? Autoimmune diseases like crazy. Autoimmune diseases are defined by the loss of this bacterial DNA and the food to feed it in terms of driving us into a place where we're too clean. We become reacting to ourselves. And so we have to kind of march away from thinking the sterility is, you know, important or good. It's not. Maybe it isn't surgery, but my wife is an RN for years and years. She's always reminding me to keep things clean in the surgical suite. But they're even using now a uh, very powerful probiotic treatment for people that have C. diff, uh, Clostridium difficile. Now we're getting into an age where antibiotics don't work very well. And you've used the broad spectrum on the person, and you've used the other one, and the other one, and boy, nothing works, and the person's going to die. What's the next call? Fecal transplant. What? A fecal transplant is the most cutting edge, 92% effective for Clostridium difficile, which is an antibiotic resistant infection. So we're getting there, whether we like it or not. We have to acknowledge that, in fact, that if somebody's circling the drain, going to die, and Clostridium difficile has got them, and they're in the ICU. They go to the husband or the wife or whoever's closest to them and say, can I have some of your feces, please? And take it down to the lab, put it into sterile, you know, into some saline and mix it into a slurry and flush the lower intestines and the person survives nine out of 10 times. Wow, that's not antibiotic. <laughs> it's extremely probiotic in a very unique way. So we are being forced to actually start to look at this in a new way in terms of the science saving lives. Um, so we are literally bacterial sapiens. Take that home, think about it, because it's really important that uh, we, we do this. I think, I think this is that fantastic here. It has a lot to do with food safety. Matt, listen to this one, buddy. Biofilms on the inside of stainless steel or inside of rubber linings and stuff. One cell never gets you. It's when they all get together when they get you. They team up on you. And they figured this out a few years back where they looked at... Um, the Vibria officii, which is basically a form of bacteria found in, in jellyfish. And they found that jellyfish, bioluminous, they create light, but they only do it at certain times of the day. And what they found was the bacteria in their bellies would start out at very low levels and do nothing. But as soon as they got a mass big enough to do something together, they had intercellular communications with chemicals that said, let's all get excited and vibrate. But they only did it when they got a mass of them together and they intercellular communication triggered the light to go on. And they would go until they get rid of all the bacteria and was spilled out again. But they figured out that in fact, low delta cell deficits didn't do anything. But when you got lots of them together, they did things together. And they figured out that 
when pathogenic bacteria want to do something really nasty to you, they have to become big enough as a group to do that to you. And they start talking to each other, doing weird things at the cellular level, submicroscopic level. So, uh, I got something going on here. Um, it's important to understand how one cell doesn't get you, but when you get lots of them working together, they can. And that's where biofilms, where you have placking effects on things, even in your gut or even in a milk line, um, conduct themselves the same way. So you don't want to get lots of bad buds working together because that's when they start to win. So interesting piece of science here in terms of how cells talk to each other at the cellular level. And it has a lot to do with food safety as well as our immune systems and how disease processes work. Pretty interesting stuff. There we go. Back one. That's my grandkids, some of them, my daughter Kaylee. I, by the way, my, favorite, my most important job in life is being grandpa. I love being grandpa. I like my kids, my grandkids better than my own kids. I think they're just great. Um, when they run up to you and say, Grandpa, Grandpa, do this, do that, it's, it's fantastic. And to see that they're all little raw milk drinkers. But one of the things we've done uh, to our children is to make them too clean. They need to hang out in good organic soils and maybe eat a little bit of it because their guts require that biodiversity. And they need to be eating um, uh, diverse foods and they need to be um, loved, obviously, and get enough sunshine. But they're out playing the irrigation ditches. And that's one of the things that on the farm we do quite a bit. And we've done it generation by generation. But um, it's really important not to have our children be too clean. Very, very important. Uh, raw milk science. It's very interesting that when you look at what all doctors agree with, there's nobody that disagrees with this right now. I, I should say nobody, but I haven't found one yet. It doesn't believe that breastfeeding isn't really, really important. When you say that statement and you rationalize why breastfeeding is important, the next question is, okay, what's next after breastfeeding? Breast milk is raw milk. You stop breastfeeding after six, eight months, a year, two years, whenever you want to stop doing that. Why would you go to a highly processed food when breast milk wasn't highly processed at all? So it's a very important sequence that's been broken in terms of understanding nourishment. And there's a bunch of studies that show this to be true. And I won't get into all of them because they're so complex, but there are 16 PubMed peer-reviewed study, the Parcel study, the Gabriel study, all these studies in Europe, where they have different kind of investment in studies. In the United States, studies come from grants from industry. We don't have any industry that's interested in spending millions of dollars to, to talk about this. But in Europe, they do. They have a little different social network on how they invest in uh, common uh, value for people. And they've got 16 studies now that are PubMed peer-reviewed. And in every one of those studies, they have an interesting little disclaimer at the end. It says, yeah, raw milk's got all these fantastic benefits, except we can't recommend that you drink it because it's too dangerous. <laughs> raw milk Institute was founded to get rid of that disclaimer. And to show that when raw milk is intended for customers, to, humans to consume, that in fact, it's perfectly wonderful and doesn't have high risk at all. In fact, it's very, very low risk. And you look at the benefit side of enhancing the immune system and you even look at lower risk. So pretty powerful stuff there. Another one I really like is the French Paradox study showed raw cheeses. And when I say raw cheese, I mean truly raw cheese. Not cheese that's been thermalized right below pasteurization temperature and then called raw. Because in the United States we have raw cheese and we have pasteurized cheese. Well, what happens at 165 degrees in 15 seconds and you're pasteurized? Well, what's 160 degrees in 10 seconds? It's raw. Not really. And that's going on, a lot of phony baloney stuff going on in terms of people masquerading their cheeses as raw when in fact they're not truly raw. Anytime you go about 110, 115 degrees, you start losing all kinds of things. Enzymes become deactivated, proteins de denatured, things start to change, bacteria are killed, and you lose the rawness of it. Remember, brain cells start dying at 105, 107 degrees. So you want to keep um, your cheeses, if you're going to be selling raw cheeses, at a low temperature, say 100 degrees, 102 degrees. Because those are the cheeses that keep the value of the raw milk and the, and the value. In the French Paradox study, uh, J.P. Lyles found that there's, a, there's an enzyme called alkaline phosphatase. And alkaline phosphatase is a very predominant enzyme. It's the third most pre predominant enzyme found in, in raw milk and breast milk. It's also the test for the effective pasteurization of milk. So when you've taken milk up to that temperature, which the enzymes are all obliterated, you also assume that the bacteria are all gone, and therefore the bad bacteria are all gone, you've destroyed the alkaline phosphatase enzyme. The alkaline phosphatase enzyme is a very, very powerful anti-inflammatory enzyme that drives 
the, Medi the Mediterranean diet along with their red wine. They think the resveratrol plays a little bit of a role. But they actually did a study on that. It's probably a truckload of red wine. I don't think you want to drink that much. But bottom line is that the resveratrol played a part, but the raw cheese is at two pounds a week that the French drink. They, they, eat, they eat two pounds of cheese a week, which is equivalent to a couple of gallons of raw milk a week in their raw cheese. And so a very interesting study how uh, the French and the French paradox and alkaline phosphates. The IMGC, Human Genome Project, that's all UC Davis PhDs that have worked around the world, uh, showing that raw milk is a fantastic food. Ted Beals and his uh, workers actually worked with uh, lactose intolerance and found that very few people ever have lactose intolerance with raw milk consumption. Dr. Ton Bars, who's actually one of our uh, board members, did a study on mice showing that uh, uh, allergies are much reduced when, when uh, people or mice drink raw milk, much reduced, and it stabilizes mast cells and keeps histamines from, from being released. Very powerful. When pasteurized milk, the raw whey protein is no longer raw, histamines are released from the mast cells and you have allergic responses. That's why pasteurized milk is the number one most allergic, allergic food in America, and raw milk's nowhere on the list. So it's very interesting that you look at the, the failing of all these Wisconsin dairies, consumers are saying no more pasteurized milk because the doctors are saying that because they're triggering all these allergies, it's hard to digest. It doesn't take too much uh, imagination to discover that maybe it's pasteurization and all the processing has destroyed the value of milk. And the losses of these dairies isn't too far off from perhaps the highly processed product, which causes a hell of a lot of problems with the product to the, the customer. You really think about it. Uh, the math is not hard to do when you really are conscious. In fact, a scientist told me just a few days ago, he was talking to me, he said, you know, the brilliance is recognized in the obvious. The emperor has no clothes. He's naked. Look at him. But it's so socially unacceptable to say that the emperor has no clothes and the obvious isn't the obvious. We see the obvious here. We experience it, our customers share it with us, we see it, we're proceeding forward with the truth. That's why I like Peg's work so much because it shows the hard facts. No bias, this is just the facts, it's the way it is and we have to make sense of it. Um, so pretty powerful. Um, again, I'll say this again, but it's really important to understand that breast milk is not sterile. 2,500 different kinds of protein that are not denatured, 700 different kinds of bacteria, good animal fats. In fact, I often talk to my vegan friends a lot of my recovering vegan friends who come to us and say, give me some fat, please, I'm falling apart. <laughs> if you look at what baby food is from mom, it's got raw animal fat in it. And those proteins are from animals, not from plants. Now, I love plant life. Plant life is fantastic. And there's a big balance between the two. It's not that you do all vegan or all dairy. It's, it's a balance. Everything's balanced here. You need a little raw fat in your life. You need these proteins, you need these enzymes. It's all in balance. So once we go crazy off one edge of the, the reservation, we tend to have problems. We need to kind of stay calm and just eat the balanced diet. Um, what else here? Okay. I love this last little part because I spent 16 years as a certified paramedic and ran 15,000 paramedic calls. And let me tell you what, I transferred a lot of kids that couldn't breathe, intubating them, doing CPR, and worse. It was not good. And it's wonderful to have a second chapter in my life when raw milk is shown to cure, prevent, and otherwise make asthma go away. A dramatically reduced asthma incidence in children. Big studies in Europe to show that. Now, we have children coming to our, our operations, our dairies and other operations, and I'm sure there's some that coming here, that used to be asthmatic or used to have food allergies, and now they're much better. What a fantastic way to connect food to medicine and bring relevance and value to the farm and the soil. Fantastic. One of the things we're doing as a campaign at Raw Milk Institute is teaching farmers how to teach more about the medical aspects of their food so they can actually bring the food to medicine and actually bring more value to the farm because that's truly the whole healing process and prevention process will be gut related and it's food related and it's unprocessed whole natural foods from reliable trusted sources. So pretty powerful here in terms of being able to connect asthma, allergies, bone density, Ear infections, that was part of the LMU study. Colds, immune depression, fermented foods, all these things uh, as a super biome builder. First fruit of life. You have a baby that's born, they do not have a gut biome. They need to get it from someplace. They get it from mama. First through the birth canal, 
transferring bacteria on the surface of the body, and then all the stuff all over their body, and then latching onto the breast and sucking away on colostrum. All that stuff goes on. That, that filthy, dirty, wonderful, gorgeous thing that happens. Let me tell you something. Critical to the transfer of the immune system to a baby that doesn't have one. And then nursing, which builds that. So what greater food on earth to bring an immune system back into order that's gone, missing, injured, damaged, than the first food of life whose intent was to do that. That's a powerful takeaway from today too, is the role of raw milk in building our immune systems, which now we have kind of in tatters in America today. So pretty powerful here in terms of that. Um, the, this whole selective evolutionary pressure in the optimal food and being rust, breast milk, and raw milk. Here's another depiction of these uh, big studies. These are just a few of them. There's, there's 19 or 20 of them. Um, but this one here I, I love because 30% reduction of colds, uh, flus, and ear infections in children. That's huge. You think about, uh, yes, sir? You've got these great informational And I can't see them. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to stand over here. But these, these studies here, you can see uh, that they're available, and PubMed is considered the unbiased basis of where you can find stuff. And if it's PubMed, it should be legit, I hope. Um, and it's a great place. If anybody has any questions, you can just Google this stuff. It's a hair. Read yourself. Heart science. A lot of people don't like to read 20-page PubMed stuff, but the summary is pretty concise, and it talks about this. So very, very strong, hard science on what we're talking about here in terms of, of healing the gut, preventing disease. Um, this is a powerful thing. Um, when you have these big studies that are peer-reviewed, you'll always find these little these little disclaimers at the end that says, do the risks of raw milk consumption, although there may be benefits, this consumption is not recommended. We stand in complete opposition to that because we understand that raw milk for pasteurization, I agree with that. Raw milk for humans, completely different food, very, very safe, doesn't have that problem. So you can get all these medical benefits if you have a legitimate source of your milk. And that's what this is all about. And we are uh, on a, a war path to getting that taken care of. And we're, we're well on the way with these 15,000 data points we have now. Um, just to give you an, in, just an insight into the differences of standards, Raw Milk Institute, the standards are zero pathogens, Listeria, Salmonella, Campylobacter, and E. coli, OFS7, STEC. None of those ever present. And we're averaging about two coliforms per milliliter. A coliform is not a pathogenic bacteria. It's kind of an indicator of sanitation. Okay? That's the Raw Milk Institute standard. Now, the FDA, under the Pasteurized Milk Ordinance, uncounted number of pathogens, in fact, they don't care. And many of you want to have it there, it's there. And up to 750 coliforms. That's dramatic difference. And that's what we're doing here. And that's what uh, Churchtown's done, that's what 16 other dairies have done, and other dairies, which is pretty powerful to see the influence of coming out with standards and actually being proud of it and making it something that's relevant. So pretty powerful in the difference. Here's another example. These are both grade A in California. On the right-hand side, that's the pasteurized milk ordinance. On the left-hand side, that's Raw Milk Institute with California standards. Less than 10 coliforms, zero pathogens. These, these uh, milk filters, which simply just filter the milk, they let milk go through, and they catch a fly leg or some little fleck or something you don't want to see in your milk. And uh, they look like they're new. And you'll notice that sitting on like a lab table there with a little tag on it, because we look at these. And they're very, very clean. This was thrown in the back of somebody's pickup, because they didn't care. And you see it's just covered with manure. So, Here's the unfortunate thing. I got beat up once really, really bad because I was talking to a bunch of dairymen that were you know, sitting there milking pasteurized. How dare you call our milk filthy? I said, you know what? How can you afford to work hard and make your filters look like that when it doesn't matter? Because you're on a milk line with 10 other dairies being picked up and all that milk's being dumped into one tank and you don't get paid any difference for clean milk. Isn't that tragic? Because if you are busting your butt and doing a good job over here, you're not getting paid five cents more. And all the other, you're right. So it, it was a great segue to tell them, hey, listen, you're getting cheated if you do work this hard because it doesn't really matter if you have it the other way. So pretty profound, visibly, you can see the difference between cleanliness in terms of that. Now, there may be some dairies out there doing a great job, and I'm sure there are, but they're not getting paid different than this guy who's doing it that way. Um, this is the kind of environment where 
the big CAFOs, and some CAFOs are much cleaner than that, but again, they're all mixed together, so it doesn't really matter. Um, this is the environment where you, you have cows, clean, green, sunshine, and if there's a little bit of manure, we've tested the manure. You generally don't find pathogens, sometimes you do, but generally not. The conditions don't support the growth of pathogens very well. Um, so difference in conditions, very, very important. Raw milk is not all the same. So people say raw milk's one thing, say, no, I'm sorry, it's not. Really, it's different. And if you think about conditions, it's different. Uh, here are a bunch of things found in breast milk and in raw milk and in pasteurized milk and commercial infant formula. And there's a bunch of things which I'm not going to get into because we could talk about the, each of these things for literally two hours. But all of these different interesting immune factors and nutrients are very interesting and play very important roles. And I'll tell one story that I think is really interesting. This oligosaccharide one right here. Dr. Bruce German, who was the founder of the International Milk Genomics Consortium at UC Davis, PhD, great guy, started this thing 14, 15 years ago. They didn't know why this oligosaccharide was present in breast milk and in raw milk. Oligosaccharide is a sugar, but it's not digestible by your body. So why would it be there? They thought it was an anomaly of nature. Oh, it's just there, we don't understand it. It's an anomaly. Well, when they figured out what it was, it really drove home the point about the biome. Oligosaccharides feed the bacteria in the gut, not your body. So when you are born, the way that the body works is that the oligosaccharides don't feed certain bacteria and feed other bacteria. Because they only want certain bacteria to thrive, the bifidobacteria. And they suppress the growth and starve the growth of other bacteria. And oligosaccharides play that role. They allow the bacteria to survive the pH of the, of the stomach, which is higher when you're born than when you're older. But they also, when going down in the lower gut, actually feed that flora to beneficially, selectively enhance its growth and dominate bad bacteria so babies don't get sick and die from bad bacteria. That was a discovery just 10 years ago. So we have just scratched the, earth, the surface on understanding the complexity and wonders the wonders of, of raw milk and how incredibly integrated they are in the beginning of life. So pretty powerful stuff there. And there's all kinds of other things. The phosphatase enzyme that we talked about, um, lactase producing bacteria, which obviously helps us create lactase. Lactobacillus creates lactase, therefore you don't have lactose intolerance. All those kinds of things are all part of the gut biome. Um, so anyway, just understand there's a whole lot of things and more and more things are discovered every day. Um, in fact, there's a splash newsletter that comes out from UC Davis. If you ever want to see a very fascinating read on this stuff, it's from the PhDs that are writing the studies that come out every month. If you want to look at that, go to rawmilkinstitute.org and look up. We have 50 of them there from, 50 to, from back five, six years. In fact, they were so inflammatory, the splash newsletter, the FDA wrote them an email saying, do not allow the public to see this information. They won't understand it. We want the public to see it. So we publish it on the Rommel Institute because I'd be given an early subscriber to it and the scientists get to read it, but nobody else gets to. So I put it up for the world to see and unfortunately not everybody reads it, but fascinating stuff about camel's milk and about all kinds of different things about the different kinds of milk produced by a mom when they have a baby boy or a baby girl, the milk is different. Oh, it's fascinating stuff, really, really good stuff. Here's pictures of pasteurized milk magnified 175 degrees, or 75 times versus 175 times pasteurized versus raw. This looks like, like a coral reef. That's very organized, kind of interesting place. This looks like sandpaper. And this is ultra high temperature pasteurized at 280 degrees. You can see the homogenization process as well as the pasteurization process literally degrading the milk tremendously from what it is physically at, in raw form. Here it is. 4,200 uh, 4, times versus 175 times. You see massive degradation. In fact, uh, in the 1800s, raw milk was called white blood because it looks so much like blood. Um, which goes kind of what Peg was talking about, which these, these milk banks, mandatory pasteurization of mother's milk banks, a lot of the professionals in the medical community are lamenting the fact that this milk is not, doesn't have these elements in it necessary to support life, especially in the needle, neonatal intensive care unit. I stood in front of a, a crowd of PhDs, this little old raw milk farmer, and I said, hey guys, this was up in Quebec, Canada last year, and I said, why don't we just test the donor? You would never pasteurize blood if you're going to give a transfusion. Would we? No, we wouldn't pasteurize blood. Well, why would we pasteurize milk from a mother? Why can't we just test the donor to assure that they don't have hepatitis or HIV or whatever? We can do those tests. 
And we don't have urgency that we have to do it today. We can do it over three or four days and freeze them up. So there's ways to do this. And I think that we're coming around now to seeing that outcomes are much better when we have a raw milk for babies for mothers with donors' milk. So this is all very relevant in terms of understanding what we're doing with the value of raw milk from cows. Pretty powerful stuff. So um, when you're choosing unprocessed milk, uh, you want to make sure that you understand its origin. And you can also get all these values out of it. Raw milk is very anti-inflammatory, suppresses mast cell release of histamines, that's why it's really good for asthma. It's very gut friendly, supports the immune system. And you know, pasteurized milk has been identified as the most allergenic food. I said it again, but I'll say it again. Uh, it's very undigestible by children because children do not have a developed digestive tract. They are intended to be consuming raw milk. Uh, breast milk's raw. Um, there are dead pieces of bacteria and denatured proteins in pasteurized milk, which trigger all kinds of allergies to occur. Because those aren't, those aren't things that are supposed to be in your body. Your body recognizes them at foreign and says, amass the mucus, histamines go crazy, hack your lungs out, because in fact, there's stuff in there that's dead. And your body's filled with living things, not dead things. Waste, waste is considered dead, get them out of here. Um, so more and more doctors are prescribing a dairy-free diet because of the reaction coming from common milk you buy in the store. And there's a few doctors now that are waking up to the fact that raw milk is available and it, it makes them look really good because the doctor, wow, made that asthma go away. Ooh, that's cool. Uh, so pretty powerful, but it's new, new stuff that's coming on. Um, you see customers reporting all kinds of benefits from raw milk. In fact, if you go to Farmers Over Pharmacies, and you look up the videos, we've got seven up there right now. One of them is really, really heartfelt. Her name is Kara. And Kara, excuse me, Kara, callback. And she was literally one month away from having a colostomy tube from Crohn's disease. And she said, wow, this is, they're gonna take out 12 feet of my intestines and I'm gonna poop in a plastic bag? Wow. She searched out alternatives and actually found nutrition deep nutrition with bone broth and unprocessed whole foods and lots and lots of raw milk kefir. And she was off of Remicade, off of 6MP, which both have side effects of cancer, by the way, and off of antibiotics and off of corticosteroids, and within six months was completely normal. Wow. Normal. Does anybody have any idea how many colostomy tubes are installed every year? Mm -hmm. 130,000 a year. With one million people uh, with Crohn's disease, Crohn's irritable bowel. If that's not the manifestation of true evil in terms of what's going on and where we're going, uh, we, that's a wake-up call, huge. That's a fire, it's a firestorm in terms of understanding. And it's a quiet firestorm because people aren't proud of the fact they're having pain, they're at home, uh, going to the bathroom 20 times a day. I mean, it's, it's horrendous, they can't keep a job. It's a drain on our medical system and it's a drain on their own uh, lives. But Tara, Made it go away. She's perfectly fine now teaching others how to do that through simply eating the right kinds of foods. If you go to the Crohn's Colitis Foundation and you look up this kind of thing, you'll see a blog report, all these doctors, they'll say, food doesn't matter, we don't know what causes it, and nothing heals it. Either extremely ignorant, biased, or stupid, I'm not sure. But the bottom line is the evidence is very clear that this is a loss of the biome with extreme inflammation, if you bring the biome back into activity and you get rid of the inflammation, it goes away. So this is very progressive stuff, but we gotta say it louder and more often and we gotta show examples. And that's why we put this video up of this young lady showing a complete transformation in her body by eating the right kinds of foods. Dental problems, eczema, eczema turns off. I haven't seen a kid that didn't turn their eczema off within literally weeks. Uh, we have some pictures of a little boy. He was only three years old, just covered with eczema. And within 90 days, drinking raw milk, completely pink perfect, no eczema at all. Um, lactose intolerance, high C-reactive protein, ear infections, all these things are reported and sometimes in the literature supported it with the, the science as well, but certainly supported by uh, customers that report back to us all the time. And I would encourage you to start working with your customers. Hey, do you have a story to report on your raw milk? And show that to others because milk is medicine. It brings true value to farmers and it's a powerful way forward. Uh, here is uh, the consumption of, of pasteurized milk in the last, uh, since 1950s. It's just Crashing like an airplane. Here's the uh, consumption of yogurt. Pasteurized yogurt, by the way. But yogurt, people are eating their, their foods in a semi-probiotic uh, fashion. And raw milk's been going that same way. I don't have a chart for raw milk because we don't have any data from the USDA to get that. But it's interesting to note that pasteurized yogurt with the addition of bacteria and fermentation actually has had a little CPR done on it. It's come back to life to a certain extent. 
and uh, his, it's much easier to, to digest. Here's a picture of Tara over here, and this is when she was in the hospital. Um, this my days when I was a paramedic, when I still had hair, and I was a young guy. But uh, uh, Farmers Over Pharmacy is definitely worth uh, going and watching because it's powerful stories of real people have recovered themselves from near tragic uh, consequences. There's a little picture of Kicker Johnson over there with his Rama Kiefer. So bone, uh, bone broth and Rama Kiefer versus pain, colostomies and Remicade. Uh, bone broth, Rama Kiefer versus inhalers and corticosteroids and EpiPens and antibiotics. And health happiness versus huge expense and compromised life are literally the balances we're talking about here, uh, which are uh, not promoted in the medical journals and not promoted as a, a policy in America and not promoted as part of our culture. But we need to have it in our culture badly, badly. Badly. So, people ask me, what drives your energy and why are you so excited? Well, I'll tell you what, it's not hard. 15,000 paramedic calls hauling kids off the hospital doing CPR and intubation, defibrillation and drugs versus watching happy kids run around. It's pretty powerful. Thank you so much for hearing what I've had to say today, and I'm open for questions, and I'd love to have a dialogue here. But that's my presentation for today. Thank you so much. This little girl, this little girl's at a farmer's market in Los Angeles where we directly interface with our customers and uh, she never gets sick. She's the one in the daycare that never gets sick and mom just loves it and uh, it's, it's really very powerful. And you know, another thing that's very powerful is when you stand across the farmer's market table and you hear an accent, a Russian accent, a German accent, a South American, Hispanic accent, give me that milk like back home, I want it right now. <laughs> You get an American mom coming up there and she goes, I don't know about that raw monk, it might kill me. <laughs> it's a cultural thing. It really, really is. And sometimes I say, hey, why don't you guys go talk together? You know, the, the mom from Russia and this mom from over here. Why don't you guys have a little chit-chat come back and talk to me in a few minutes? And, you know, it's interesting the dialogue they have. And it, it's really interesting uh, the stories they have to tell and, and the communications they have. But we have a cultural problem here. We've been so enculturated into believing that antibiotics and sterilized foods and, and, and sterile, 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 sterile are the only way to go. And it's not uh, whole food nutrition. Any questions or thoughts? Yes, sir. What about the cholesterol? Cholesterol. Great question. There's a lot of dispute right now about cholesterol. I'm not a big cholesterol guy. The reason I'm not a big cholesterol guy is because your brain's made of cholesterol. And cholesterol is critical to insulating your nerves in your body. Without cholesterol, you actually start to fall apart. You mean you are a big cholesterol guy. What's that? You mean you are yeah. a big cholesterol guy. Depends on how you look at it. You need good cholesterol badly to be healthy. And the other part of it is, when you go to the autopsies, and I've been to many, and you look at the placking that occurs inside the coronary arteries, almost always, almost always you find an ulcer underneath it. You find some kind of infectious process, something that the body was trying to repair. And cholesterol went out there to do that work, and it built up, built up, built up. Dr. Annette Jewett in Los Angeles will tell you it's inflammation in your body that's really the problem. Because when you have inflammation, it's from an infectious process or ulceration, and the cholesterol is coming out there to try to smooth it over and patch it up and get thicker and thicker and thicker. Okay? But if you didn't have the infection to begin with, the cholesterol would just go mind its business. It wouldn't misbehave and have a problem. So you need good cholesterols, and you need to control your inflammation in your body. You need, infl you need inflammation, but it needs to come and go and not be chronic and high. And that's what happens when you have a functioning immune system with good fats coming from cows on green grass pastures, by the way, thank you very much, with the omega-3 fatty acid ratios and the CLA, the conjugated linoleic acid, which is anti-cancer, from cows coming from the right kind of conditions. So there's more work to be done on that, but I think that there's a lot of evidence showing that in fact, cholesterol is not, uh, not our enemy. It's wrong kind of cholesterols and inflammation that work in concert along with some other factors that are actually driving us to become quite ill. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, do the health benefits of raw milk change if you heat it? Is it better to be drinking cold, drunk cold? Or, um, Feel free. Put on earmuffs because the milk starts to scream very quietly that it's being cooked to death. So the bottom line is if you want to drink your milk in hot, fine. But remember that you need to have some raw if you're gonna get the value of, of, of what we're talking about here, it must be at less than 105 degrees. You can't take it up high. If you take it up high, you start losing these values. Now, if you're drinking plenty of raw dairy, great. If you wanna cook some, make some hot chocolate, great. But you've gotta have part of your diet on the raw side to get these values. Kefir smoothies, fantastic way to go. Ice cream, 
fantastic way to go. Uh, but t these values we're talking about is from the, the whole raw side. And you can certainly have some cooked, but you recognize you're not going to have that value. Any other thoughts? Okay. I wanted to add the microbiologist perspective. When um, you increase the heating temperature of milk, um, you kill off more of the bacteria, the good bacteria that can compete with pathogens, and what happens? The pathogens grow faster. So the ultra-pasteurized milk um, is a sterile system, and it's going to support more growth of pathogens than raw milk because raw milk has the competing microbes to protect you. The evidence is very clear on that because 85 people have died in the last, oh, since 1970. On the CDC website, you can see these 85 deaths. And they've all been pasteurization resist, uh, post pasteurization contamination, improperly pasteurized milk, or pasteurization that actually works quite well. But the contamination of listeria after pasteurization, where they don't have competition, it's a cold environment and plenty of food. And listeria loves that environment. We've had deaths just recently. Blue Bell ice cream killed a few people. There's been some cheeses. There's been, so really, the microbiome of the milk itself is semi self protective. It's not perfect. But it does a nice job of, of suppressing pathogens, especially if you don't create a vacuum and there's no competition. Listeria is the big killer, by the way, in, in pasteurized dairy. Uh, it's not really associated with raw dairy. E. coli 157H7 is now associated more with raw dairy. And that's a superbug that's mostly antibiotic resistant. But we have rapid tests now where we can actually test in less than 12 hours and know what that product is. So there's technologies coming on quickly to help us be able to mediate the bad bugs and make sure we ha never have those. Yes, sir. What's that again? What's the maximum scale you can to Scale. It has to do with the healthy environment. It has to do with healthy environment. I don't think you can do it with 10,000 cows. I don't think you can do that because the environment, you're not going to get to pastures, you're not going to have the sunshine, you're going to have lack of attention to individual animals. That's just my own bias. We've been able to successfully do it with 500 cows, but we've got 500 acres of pasture to go with it. Uh, and we have three sets of, of herds. We've got 150 cows or 175 cows each herd, so we can actually keep them out and actually uh, spend time with them. Um, we at Raw Milk Institute have certified one cow dairies, three cow dairies, 15 cow dairies, 28 cow dairies, 200 cow dairies, and 500 cow dairies. So we've got a range of dairies. I, I don't think we'll ever be at more than 750, 800 on the top end because you have so much pasture requirement, the infrastructure for, to keep the environment right needs to be that. And, and we just don't see that. Uh, so that's just kind of my perspective on that. But we get to see what's possible. Yes, ma'am. Well, can those dairies support themselves? Yes. Great question, by the way. Economics of dairy. Okay, can, can a raw milk dairy support itself? And I would say absolutely yes. Here's the reason why. There's innate value to raw milk. Not only for the medical benefits, but also the cleanliness requirements and the state legal and insurance and all that stuff. Here's the thing I love to say. In 1969, your Ford truck cost you $3,900. And milk was about $10 per hundredweight to the dairyman. That's milk, all milk, go to be pasteurized, milk, whatever. Now, your Ford truck costs you almost $40,000, and the milk is $13 to $15 a hundredweight. Ooh, that's bad math. Really bad math. You think about it, we have not kept up with the value of our food. It's become extremely inexpensive. And if you look at raw milk uh, for, for customers, for people to consume, we're talking about $115, $120, $150 a hundredweight. So raw milk for human consumption has actually become a value-added product for the dairyman because you can't fake it. You can't go out there and treat it with something to make it better or cleaner. You have to have it clean from ground zero. Right. So there's innate value to raw milk for the customer who's fat incredible value to their body and the benefits they get, to the farmer, to the soil, to the cows, to the entire grass-to-glass <laughs> ecosystem. So yes, that's why people go from conventional to organic, and when that fell apart, they jump into raw, because the value is there and the hard work will pay off. Any questions? Well, you got so many of them. Ab, go ahead. No, I just want to say more about that, that, that the, one of the reasons that, that the, the raw milk dairies are working is that they get to sell at the retail price. Right. And that's, that's a huge issue. Right. And, and, and it's partly because they're the small scale, so that it makes sense for them to sell into their neighborhood. They're local. And they get the, it local enough, so it's actually working in a certain way in their favor that they have to be, that, oh, they, 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 well, no, it, 
I, what I mean to say is, that, I mean, there's, there's regulations not allowing people to sell retail, in retail stores anyway. Right. But if they're, they're small enough, it's going to make sense that they can live and they can make a living. They can and make, the they can processors live on it. won't take the, the money out of you, right. Right. and the distributors it, won't take the money out of you. Totally it's full value economics. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. Let's. Yes, David. Um, so, uh, first of all, thank you for a tremendous talk. And um, I want to just mention that there is one group of doctors that um, will say to you, how can we boost your immune system? How can we promote your wellness? And they're called naturopathic doctors. Yay. They're licensed <laughs> in every state in New England now, and they're seeking licensure yeah. in, in New York State. So support them if you, yeah. if you hear about the bill. Um, one American writer said, it's hard to get a man to understand something if he's being paid not to understand it. And you talk about going directly to consumers, which makes a lot of sense, because that's something that can spread in an amazing way without, without it, uh, all sorts of legal and regulatory impediments uh, also being ignored. But where are you finding levers to also make a case to policymakers or certain industries? Where are the levers that we can perhaps use to... Passionate, pissed law? off moms. <laughs> You'd be very impressed at what's happened when you get somebody saying, I can't have my raw milk from my dairyman. Mm. You get a thousand moms coming in with their kids saying, not on my, I'll rip your eyes out. Mm. They really get excited and upset. <laughs> and you know what? The, the mom is, and dads are sacred. They vote. They vote with their dollars. They vote with their, at the ballot box. So it's hard for a politician to sit there and listen to 1,200 moms come up with their moms, and some of them are breastfeeding. It's like, don't you even think about it. And they got their PhDs, and they're well-educated, and they've got a story to tell. It, you just can't do it. And the processors, boy, we better not make this a big deal because it's going to be on front page news, and oh, it's going to be ugly because the moms are against us. So I would say that the, that the customers, the moms, with their children, with the stories themselves, the most powerful thing we have, and they're the ones that when they have an opportunity to speak, they show up in mass, and they tell a story, and nobody wants to mess with it. So I would say that was the one thing you would leverage for sure. And you also use the science. You get the Peg Coleman's and the, and, the, and the Joe Heckman's out there and you get everybody else coming together showing, here's the science, here's the true facts, and by the way, this other stuff, BS. Um, you know, really get, yes, Joe? Please. Come on up here, Joe. You're a professor. Come on up here, bud. A quarter of what I've learned, I've learned from you. Dr. Joe Heckman from, uh, from Rutgers University. I just want to say a little bit about some of the history of this raw milk movement because I'm holding up here a paper that really started uh, me on a pathway to write a review article about the raw milk movement. And Mark McAfee was the first speaker that we brought to Rutgers University to talk about raw milk. And because I, I organized a seminar series about this, and it was supported by the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. We're still struggling to make legal access in New Jersey. But Mark gave a fantastic seminar back 10 years ago, 2008. He was there, and his seminars, his talks just get better and better. And so I brought along with me some, some of my papers, and it's also online. You can find it online. It's called Securing Fresh Food from Fertile Soil, Challenges to the Organic and Raw Milk Movements. And so you can look it up and you can read it. And some of the medical literature that he cited, much of it, is summarized in this paper. And so you have access to that information. By a PhD so, from Rutgers, which is and, pretty and, cool. And, and, and so on. And uh, the other thing I'd just like to uh, comment, this is a really beautiful farm. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure. Thank you, Mark. See me if you want a copy of the paper. I see the boss coming here. I see lots of questions and lots of enthusiasm, which is really wonderful, and I really want to thank you, Mark, for an excellent presentation. Um, I wonder if maybe we can take one or maybe two more questions, and then we can carry on this conversation um, over raw milk and cheese and, yes, and sun tea from our garden. So we'll just take two more questions yeah, and we'll wrap it up. A couple more and we'll wrap it up. Liz, stand up. This is Liz Reitzig, and she is an incredible powerhouse on Washington, Washington, D.C., going from congressional office to congressional office, Senate's office to Senate's office, fighting for the rights of whole food nutrition and raw milk access. So, Liz, thank you for coming all the way up from D.C. Thank you.
<laughs> You're one of those. <laughs> Liz, thank you for that. Uh, currently, raw milk is uh, made illegal in interstate commerce. You cannot take raw milk across state lines legally. The FDA doesn't want you to do that. Liz is responsible for organizing a, a parade of moms that said, bring it on. We're taking raw milk across state lines. Arrest us today. And the FDA came out with an official letter said, we're not interested in the moms. We just want to go off to the dairyman. So she's, she's got a hell of a bite, just to let you know, in terms of the FDA listening to tenacious moms. And so we're, we're a little bit, we got a little ways to go. We need to have it legalized so we can take rum up across state lines legitimately <laughs> and not just through moms and ice chests. But you think about icy roads and rainy and snow conditions, it becomes a food safety issue uh, in, in really, literally in accident terms. You got kids in car seats driving 150 miles to get their milk. This is stupid, ridiculous. It's irresponsible. It's not green. So to bring milk to children uh, that need that for all the reasons we've stated today, uh, and accommodate them is a very powerful thing, a mission, and she's working on that very hard with their partnerships. Okay. Yes, ma'am. That is a very good question, and I don't have a great answer for you because it's expensive to do raw milk right. In fact, one of the things we, we often caution people is if you find cheap raw milk, caution yourself. Because cheap raw milk means you took a shortcut. Uh, I'll, I'll quote Shauna Barr, who was one of our listed dairymen who's in, in Shasta, uh, California. Uh, she was number three to be listed. She said, you know, I, I just closed my cow share because I'm going back to teach. I did it for 10 years. I loved it. But I didn't realize how cheap your milk was because she bought it at Berryville store. She was getting $18 a gallon for her milk. We sell ours at, at the store for $13.50 or $14. And she didn't realize because of the fact that she spent so much time, so much money to do raw milk properly. And she only had three cows. So the, the relatively value of milk in raw form that's clean and pure is an interesting subject because we're undervaluing something really critical. What if, I'll just throw a, a dream out here for you guys, a dream that we can share for the future. Mm -hmm. What if your medical insurance said, we'll cover it 100% because it's going to prevent $50,000 of cost for the next five years from inhalers and ICUs and everything else. And by the way, we'll take the $1,500 in costs because it prevents so much. That's farmers over pharmacies. And I'd like to see us going to a paradigm of let's reposition where our investments are to prevent disease so we don't have to endure the cost for the long term. And we aren't there yet as a culture because we are in a weird place right now. But bottom line is we need to get to a place where we value and appreciate preventative medicine through nutrition and farmers markets. Thank you. I think that's time for milk and cookies, guys. Thank you.